Olá, meus amigos. Volto aqui novamente para apresentar a sexta parte deste incrível vídeo. E é interessante que entrou justamente numa linha que uma das linhas que eu mais gosto, é, que fala a respeito sobre o Kundalini, sobre a ativação da glândula pineal. É um assunto muito interessante que acredito que daqui para frente vocês vão adorar. Tá ok? Então vamos dar uma olhadinha no vídeo e depois eu espero que vocês deixem seus comentários, né? E que possa também as pessoas que estão adentrando aqui, que não conhecem o canal, que por favor procure, procure se inscrever no canal. Eu agradeço muito, então vamos lá dar uma olhadinha no vídeo. When Kundalini is activated, it stimulates the sixth chakra and pineal center, and this area starts to regain some of its evolutionary functions. Darkness meditation has been used for thousands of years as a way to activate the sixth chakra in the area of the pineal gland. Activation of this center allows a person to be able to see their inner light Whether it is the proverbial yogi or shaman retreating deep into a cave, or Taoist or Mayan initiate, or a Tibetan monk, all traditions incorporate a period of time during which one goes into the darkness. The pineal gland is the gateway to being able to experience one's subtle energy directly. The philosopher Nietzsche said, If you stare into the abyss long enough, Eventually you find the abyss stares back at you. Dolmens, or ancient portal tombs, are among the oldest remaining structures on Earth. Most date to the Neolithic period of 3000 to 4000 BC, and some in Western Europe are 7000 years old. The dolmen was used to enter into perpetual meditation as a way for a human to bridge the inner and outer worlds. As one continues to meditate in total darkness, eventually one begins to observe inner energy or light as the third eye becomes active. The circadian rhythms, which are governed by the sun and moon channels, no longer control the functions of the body, and a new rhythm is established. The seventh chakra, for thousands of years, has been represented by the Om symbol, a symbol which is constructed by Sanskrit signs representing the elements. When Kundalini rises beyond the sixth chakra, it begins to create an energy halo. Halos appear consistently in the religious paintings of different traditions, in all different parts of the world. The halo, or the depiction of an energy signature around an awakened being, is common to virtually all religions in all parts of the world. The evolutionary process of awakening the chakras is not the property of one group or one religion. It is the birthright of every human being on the planet.
The crown chakra is the connection to the divine, that which is beyond duality, beyond name and form. Akhenaten was a pharaoh whose wife was Nefertiti. He is referred to as the son of the sun. He rediscovered Aten, or the word of God within himself, uniting Kundalini and consciousness. In Egyptian iconography, once again, the awakened consciousness is represented by the solar disk, seen above the heads of gods or awakened beings. In the Hindu and yogic traditions, this halo is called Sahasrara, the thousand petal lotus. The Buddha is associated with the symbol of the lotus. The phyllotaxis pattern is the same pattern as can be found in a blooming lotus. It is the flower of life pattern, the seed of life. It is the fundamental pattern into which all forms fit. It is the very shape of space itself, or a quality inherent to akasha. At one time in history, the flower of life symbol was prevalent all over earth. The flower of life is found guarded by lions at the entrance of the most holy places in China and other parts of Asia. The 64 hexagrams of the I Ching often surround a yin-yang symbol which is yet another way of representing the flower of life. Within the flower of life is the geometric basis for all of the platonic solids, essentially every form that can exist. The ancient flower of life begins with the geometry of the Star of David, or upward and downward facing triangles. Or in 3D, these would be tetrahedral structures. This symbol is a yantra, a sort of program that exists within the universe, the machine that is generating our fractal world. Yantras have been used as tools for awakening consciousness for thousands of years. The visual form of the yantra is an external representation of an inner process of spiritual unfolding. It is the hidden music of the universe made visible comprised of intersecting geometrical forms and interference patterns. Each chakra is a lotus, a yantra, a psychophysiological center through which the world can be experienced. A traditional yantra, such as can be found in the Tibetan tradition, is invested with rich layers of meaning, sometimes incorporating a complete cosmology and worldview. The yantra is a constantly evolving pattern which works through the power of repetition or iteration of a cycle. The power of the yantra is all but lost in today's world because we seek meaning only in the external form and we do not connect it to our inner energies through intention. There is a good reason why priests, monks and yogis traditionally have been celibate. 
Today, all but a tiny few know why they are practicing celibacy, because the true purpose has become lost. Quite simply, if your energy is going into producing more sperm or eggs, as the case may be, then there is not as much to fuel the rising of Kundalini, which activates the higher chakras. Kundalini is life energy, which is also sexual energy. When awareness becomes less focused on animal urges and is put into the objects reflective of the higher chakras, that energy flows up the spine and to those chakras. Many of the tantric practices teach how to master sexual energy so that it can be used for higher spiritual evolution. Your state of consciousness creates the right conditions for your energy to be able to grow. Entering a state of consciousness takes no time. As Eckhart Tolle says, awareness and presence always happen in the now. If you are trying to make something happen, then you are creating resistance to what is. It is the removing of all resistance that allows evolutionary energy to unfold. In the ancient yogic tradition, yoga postures were used to prepare the body for meditation. Hatha yoga was never intended solely as an exercise regime, but as a way to link one's inner and outer worlds. The Sanskrit word hatha means sun, ha, and moon, tha. In the original Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, the purpose of the eight limbs of yoga are the same as the Buddha's Eightfold Path, to liberate one from suffering. When the polarities of the dual world are in balance, a third thing is born. We find the mysterious golden key that unlocks the evolutionary forces of nature. This synthesis of the sun and moon channels is our evolutionary energy. Because humans are now identified almost exclusively with their thoughts and the outer world, it is a rare individual that achieves a balance of the inner and outer forces which allow Kundalini to awaken naturally. For those identified only with the illusion, Kundalini will always remain a metaphor, an idea, rather than a direct experience of one's energy and consciousness. Life, Liberty and the Pursuit of Happiness We live our lives pursuing happiness out there, as if it is a commodity. We have become slaves to our own desires and craving. Happiness is not something that can be pursued or purchased like a cheap suit. This is Maya, illusion, the endless play of form. In the Buddhist tradition, samsara, or the endless cycle of suffering, is perpetuated by the craving of pleasure and aversion to pain. Freud referred to this as the pleasure principle. Everything we do is an attempt to create pleasure, to gain something that we want, or to push away something undesirable that we don't want. Even a simple organism like the paramecium does this. It is called response to stimulus. Unlike a paramecium, humans have more choice. We are free to think, and that is the heart of the problem. 
It is the thinking about what we want that has gotten out of control. The dilemma of modern society is that we seek to understand the world not in terms of archaic inner consciousness, but by quantifying and qualifying what we perceive to be the external world by using scientific means and thought. Thinking has only led to more thinking and more questions. We seek to know the innermost forces which create the world and guide its course. But we conceive of this essence as outside of ourselves, not as a living thing intrinsic to our own nature. It was the famous psychiatrist Carl Jung who said, One who looks outside dreams. One who looks inside awakes. It is not wrong to desire to be awake, to be happy. What is wrong is to look for happiness outside when it can only be found inside. Olá pessoal, incrível, né? É, eu, eu fico muito feliz de poder ter a oportunidade através desse canal de poder apresentar a todos vocês é, estes conhecimentos antigos, né? como eu sempre disse, é, nunca devemos desprezar os conhecimentos antigos. Então tem muita coisa que acontece realmente na nossa vida, na nossa existência, no nosso organismo, na nossa espiritualidade, que mal sabemos. Então é importante que nós é, possamos entender o funcionamento de toda a nossa existência. Então eu... Eu espero que daqui para frente a gente possa agora assistir a sétima e última parte deste incrível vídeo. Ok? Até mais! Música